measuring the extent to which we're closely competing with one another. What would happen, for example, if gamma was equal to zero? Yeah, this would be zero. And what does gamma denote? Exactly. When the competitor changes its price, how much does that increase the demand for my product? That's sort of the extent to which we're competing with one another, right? So this is a measure of the intensity or closeness of competition between the two firms. This thing is just the pre-merger markup. So why is this thing the pre-merger markup, uh, uh, Joshua? Joshua? Well, why is this thing the pre-merger markup? We have the pre-merger price up here. Pre-merger markup is pre-merger price minus cost, right? So why is this quantity here the pre-merger markup? Well, here's the pre-merger price. If we subtract cost off from that, right? The pre-merger price is beta C plus alpha over 2 beta minus gamma, right? And if we subtract cost from that, that's exactly alpha minus uh, beta minus gamma times cost over 2 beta minus gamma, right? So this thing is exactly the pre-merger markup. And 1 half, what's that? That's the pass-through rate under linear demand, which we studied. So prices increase by 1 half times this measure of the intensity of competition times the, the, um, the pass-through rate. The markup times the pass-through rate times the intensity of competition. So these, that was an example so that we could go through the relevant algebra. Um, but it's actually pretty intuitive why these are the factors that show up, and they show up much more broadly. So let's focus on the first two ones for the moment. Uh, the intensity of competition and the markup. So let, let's, let's imagine that Burger King and McDonald's were going to merge with one another. right? So why would this lead Burger King to raise its prices? Well, um, Connie, wh wh why would, just intuitively, would Burger King have an incentive to raise its prices if it merged with McDonald's? Yeah, so if they reduce their price, if they increase their price, then that will lead Burger King to sell more burgers, right? Yeah. And that will benefit the joint company, right? Um, okay, so every time Burger King sells a burger and satisfies a customer, that means that there's one person who's no longer going to consider buying a burger at McDonald's, right? And let's call that fraction of people who, if they didn't buy a Burger King burger, would buy one at McDonald's. D sub BK to MD. That's called the diversion ratio between Burger King and McDonald's. It's what fraction of the customers who buy a McDonald's burger would have other, by, by Burger King burger would otherwise have bought a McDonald's burger. This um, causes McDonald's, as a result of not having sold that burger, to lose the marginal profit it would have earned on that burger. Um, which is the markup that it would have earned on that burger, right? M sub MD. Now, once the companies merge, that counts as a loss to Burger King as well, right? Because Burger King now owns McDonald's. So if it, uh, you know, if it loses profits on its McDonald's unit, that's, that's losing profits overall. So this means that there's a new opportunity cost of making a sale which is created by the merger. So D sub BK to MD times MMD uh, is 
Now, uh, what I was trying to say here, this, this should sort of be separated, is that M sub M D is equal to the markup, the difference between price and cost for McDonald's. And then the product of these two things is the total amount of loss to Burger King of selling a burger. It loses some number of sales of McDonald's burgers. And, it, um, and what that costs it is the markup that it would have earned on those burgers. And this quantity on the left-hand side here is called the upward pricing pressure on Burger King created by the merger with McDonald's. And notice that this is exactly the two, factor, this two factors in our linear analysis, right? This was the markup, and this was the diversion ratio, because this was how much McDonald's, uh, this was the ratio of how much the other guy's sales increased to how much my sales declined. Okay, so upward pricing pressure is the diversion ratio times the markup. So, um, the op UPP is the opportunity cost that's created by a merger. But how exactly does this translate into prices? Well, as we know, if firms have higher costs, they're going to tend to charge higher prices. And uh, data, at what rate does an increase in cost change into an increase in prices? Um. What do we call that? Well, we call that the pass-through rate. That's the pass-through rate. Then. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, if you multiply the UPP by the pass-through rate, that will tell you how much the prices change as a result of the merger. So this is a little bit subtle because both of the firms' prices are changing at the same time. Um, but this is exactly the reason why we got a one-half showing up here, right? Because that's the pass-through rate for linear demand. Um, okay, so now if we want to get the impact that has on consumer welfare, how do we do that, Udo? Um, how do we convert a change in prices into a change in consumer welfare? Price times quantity. Yeah, exactly. The change in price times quantity. Right? Because the quantity that is sold is the effect of a change in price on consumer welfare. Right? Um, and a relatively, this gives us a relatively simple methodology for predicting the effects of merger. Of a merger, in order to make a prediction, one needs to measure um, the diversion ratio, the markup, and the quantity, and the pass-through. If one can measure those four things, one can predict how much consumer welfare is affected by the merger. And you can do this using internal documents from a company or studies of like which companies won which contracts and who were their closest competitors. You can do it using surveys of consumers and like you know what products they would have purchased if they didn't purchase this one. Uh, or using internet data, like if you go on Amazon it says people who are interested in this product were also interested in that product. So that gives you a sense that people who might have bought this would, if they hadn't bought that, probably have bought this other product. You can also use econometrics and demand estimation. Um, you can, for example, look at times where firms' costs change and see what effect that had on the demand in the market by changing their prices. Okay. So in the United States, um, control over mergers like this uh, comes from the Clayton Antitrust Act, which was the second antitrust act. So the first one, which we talked about uh, on Thursday, was the Sherman Antitrust Act, which made it illegal to form a cartel. Um, but you know, if it's illegal to form a cartel, why not just buy up your competitor? Right? So then they had to pass a second law, which made it illegal to merge legally with firms, um, or tried to limit them. So, why, uh, Siraj, did they not just decide in the Clayton Act to make all mergers illegal? If, if our analysis says that mergers are going to raise prices, which it does, why wouldn't they just make all horizontal mergers illegal? Um, because sometimes the market's like, best served by a natural monopoly, in which case you have like, one, uh, one person can efficiently like, increase costs and increase output. 
Yeah, so if there's economies of scale, uh, or if there's just one firm that's incompetent and another firm that's really competent, it makes a lot more sense for the competent firm to take over the incompetent firm, right? Um, so one example of this is a big debate over the AT&T merger with T-Mobile right now, is that people think it's going to reduce competition, but on the other hand, I think a lot of people of AT&T are sort of excited about the idea that AT&T's crappy network coverage will get a lot better when they also include all the T-Mobile stuff stations. Right, um, And so there's agencies in the United States that have to weigh the anti-competitive effects against the benefits coming from the economies of scale. And there are several agencies in the United States that share the responsibility for this, but there are two primary ones which, uh, which share responsibility um, by industry. So some, the, these two agencies divide up different industries. Some have responsibility for one, some, one set of industries, some have responsibility for the other. And Maria, what are the two agencies in the United States that have responsibility? The Federal Trade Commission, mm -hmm. right? And the, the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division. Of the Department of Justice. Exactly right. Um, so uh, the Department of Justice, the Antitrust Division, the Federal Trade Commission, and companies have to notify these agencies before they want to merge. Yeah, Matt. Which industries does each one cover? Oh, God. Um, I know, like, some particular examples. So, for example, all the banking stuff is DOJ. All telecommunications is DOJ. Um, cement is FTC. Newspapers are FTC. It's, it's like, I, like, you'd have to spend hours memorizing this because it's like, very disaggregated. Well, Which one? Yeah. If I what? split it up, wouldn't you have economies of scale by combining the two parts? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think so. Uh, it's sort of a historical accent. So basically, what happened is the FTC was created under um, Roosevelt, and Roosevelt wanted to cartelize a bunch of industries. He didn't want uh, to have competition, so he gave the FTC responsibility for the industries he wanted to cartelize, and the DOJ kept responsibility for the other ones. And yes, that's basically what happened. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, so, and there's, there's actually quite a lot of bureaucratic fighting, as you might imagine, over whether some things, so like, for example, imagine the DOJ has responsibility for, like, fast food, and the FTC has responsibility for, like, consumer products, and then you have companies that do both of those things, then there's, like, all this fight over, like, which agency gets responsibility for a given merger. So it's actually kind of stupid, but... Um, <laughs> Sometimes the agencies have directors who get along really well with one another, and that helps solve the problem. But so the agencies basically subpoena data from these um, companies that are trying to merge in two stages. So the first stage is that they just have to notify them that they're merging and give like the basic information that they release to the public. Then the agencies filter out about 90% of all mergers that way and say those are all fine. Then there's about 10% they say, this might be a problem. And so they say, please give us some more detailed information. And then they have one month to review that and decide whether they want more information. So if after a month they're really concerned, then they ask, give us everything you've got. You have to go do survey. You have to do all this stuff. And then they have three months on the basis of that to decide whether to block a merger. And they have a team between the two of them, about 150 PhD economists, uh, who, who do all this analysis, and a bunch of interns like you guys, if you ever want to go work for a summer at the DOJ or the FTC. Um, almost all the mergers survive uh, without getting challenged. The overwhelming majority of those that the DOJ is uncomfortable with, it finds some settlement with the party, says either, look, it's not worth it, just give up and try to merge, you know, we don't like it, or they say, well, look, we'll let you merge, but you have to like divest the following parts of your company that might be in conflict and might cause problems. And then in a very few cases, and this is what happened with AT&T and T-Mobile, it goes to court, and they fight it out. So um, <clears throat> the US regulation of antitrust with 150 PhD economists is probably the most sophisticated single infrastructure for the regulation of the economy in the world. 
Um, 